proprietary interest by the appellant in the suit property, and as the second and third respondents disclaimed any interest over the suit property, and it was clearly evident to the appellants that only the first respondent had claimed such interest in the suit property. It is not true that an adjournment of the suit property of the suit to enable the appellant's counsel to obtain instructions from them was sufficient cause. Thirdly, all the appellants were themselves absent from the court when the suit was called for a hearing and no explanation was offered for their absence. Their absence without an explanation leaves the impression that their learned counsel went to court with the expectation of being granted an adjournment as a matter of course. And if that was so, it was too presumptuous on the part of those concerned for which the appellants only have themselves to blame. The Court of Appeal in the Union Insurance Company of Kenya versus Ramzan Abdul Danji held in the court. Whereas the right to be heard is a basic natural justice concept and ought not be taken away lightly, looking at the record before the court, the court is not impressed by the point that the applicant was denied the right to defend him itself. Clearly, the applicant was given a chance to be heard, and the court is not convinced that the issue of failure by the High Court to hear the ap ap applicant will be such an arguable point in the appeal. The law is not that a party must be heard in every litigation. The law is that parties must be given reasonable opportunity of being heard, and once that opportunity is given and is not utilized, then the only point on which the party not utilizing the opportunity can be heard is why he did not utilize it, unquote. In this case, it is my view that the relevant statutory framework uh, may be considered in deciding whether or not to grant an adjournment. In this case, it is true the committee had only 10 days within which to determine the dispute. As was said in Ferdinand Waititu versus IBC, this timeline set by the Constitution and the Elections Act are neither negotiable, nor can they be extended by any court for whatever reason. It is indeed the tyranny of time, if we may call it so. That means a trial court must manage the allocated time very well so as to complete a hearing and determine an election petition at time honestly. Unquote. I also agree with the opinion that the applicant had not resigned from CCU, and even if she had resigned, that she never became a member of WIPA. This court in decision delivered on the 14th of June 2017 hearing clarified that the said decision did not confer upon the expert applicant hearing the membership status of the CCU. Accordingly, to the extent that the committee relied on the said decision as its sole basis for finding that the expert applicant belonged to two political parties, it clearly took into account irrelevant, irrelevant material. It was said a minister from Aboriginal Affairs versus PECO. A decision maker will err by failing to take into account relevant consideration or taking an irrelevant consideration into account. These grounds will only be made out if a decision maker fails to take into account a consideration which the decision maker is bound to take into account in making the decision or takes into account a consideration which the decision maker is bound to ignore. The <coughs> considerations that a decision maker is bound to consider or bound to ignore in making the decision are determined by construction of the statute conferring the discretion. Statutes might expressly state the considerations that need to be taken into account or ignored. Otherwise, they must be determined <coughs> by implication from the subject matter scope and the purpose of statute. In Zachariah Wagunza and another was office of the Registrar Academic Yeta University, <coughs> this court expressed itself as follows, and I quote, concerning relevant considerations, where a body takes account of relevant considerations, any decision arrived at becomes unlawful. Unlawful behavior might be constituted by an outright refusal to consider the relevant matter, a misdirection on a point of law, on some wholly irrelevant or extraneous consideration, and wholly omitting to take into account a relevant consideration. The holding in the Locus Classicus of Associated Provincial Picture Limited by Mr. Winnesbury best summarizes these principles, particularly in words of Lord Green, that if the statute conferring discretion, if in the statute conferring discretion there is to be found expressly or by implication matters to which the authority exercising the discretion ought to have regard, 
then in exercising the discretion, they must have regard to those matters. Conversely, if the nature of the subject matter and the general interpretation of the Act make it clear that certain matters would not be germane to the matter in question, they must disregard those matters. And unreasonableness, attention given to extraneous circumstances, disregard of public policy and things like that has all been referred to as being matters which are relevant for consideration. For instance, a person entrusted with the discretion must direct himself properly in law. He must call upon his own attention to the matters which is bound to consider. He must exclude from consideration matters which are irrelevant to the matter that he has to consider. If, if he does not obey these rules, he may truly be said, and often is said to be acting unreasonably. Similarly, you may have something so absurd that no sensible person could ever dream that it would lay within the powers of the authority and court. It is therefore clear that the only basis upon which the committee allowed the third interested parties' complaint was that the expert applicant was promoting ideology, interest, and policies of CCU by virtue of the expert applicant's name being in the list that was sent to the registrar of political parties for government. That ground was clearly irrational. If there were other grounds for allowing the complaint, they do not appear in the decision of the, complaint of the committee, and this court cannot surmise as to those other reasons and the weight and impact the committee would have attached to them had they been considered. That is a jurisdiction that is reserved to an appellate court since this court does not substitute its discretion for that of a tribunal. That parties cannot raise issues other than those which were raised before the IBC committee, before this court, was appreciated by land counsel for the respondent who urged the court to ignore issues of res judicata and jurisdiction at the same were not issues which were raised before the committee. I have however found elsewhere in this judgment that an issue going to jurisdiction can be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even an appeal. Similarly, issues revolving around the coalition agreement and the journey narrated by Mr. Nyamodi cannot be the basis for this court's determination. Mr. Nyamodi appreciated that the most important issue, which was however not dealt with by the IBC committee, was the issue of party copying. In my view, if, as it is alleged, the issue of party opening was not dealt with by the committee, then if it was, then even if it was raised before it, that issue may be presumed to have been dealt with pursuant to Explanation 5 to Section 7 of the Civil Procedure Act, which provides that any relief claimed in a suit which is not expressly granted by the decree shall for purpose of this section be deemed to have been refused. To my mind, if there were other issues which are placed before the committee, it was incumbent upon the committee to identify the same and deal with each one of them. By failing to deal with the same when the matter was before it, the committee cannot, the commission cannot purport to now justify the decision of the committee in these proceedings based on the grounds upon which its decision was not based. It is therefore not difficult to understand why the committee could not have found that the expert applicant did not cease to be a member of the CCU. Based on the evidence presented before it, unless the committee decided to go behind the same and investigate whether they were genuine or not, which it did not purport to do, the committee could not reasonably find that the expert applicant had not resigned from CCU party. And this was based on the provision section 14 of the Political Parties Act, which I have reproduced. That provision was the subject of the decision of Lenaula J, as it then was, in the case of Liam Omondi versus IBC, where he held that, and I quote, in my view, this provision is clear and requires no more than a literal interpretation. Section 14.3, in effect, demands a member of a political party who intends to resign from political party must and is obliged to give a written notice of his resignation to his political party. And if he is a sitting member of parliament, to give written notice to the clerk of the relevant house. And if he is a member of county assembly, to the clerk of the county assembly. That designation, according to the provision section 14.2, takes effect upon the same being received by the political party or the clerk of the relevant house. Upon receiving the notice, the political party or the clerk of the relevant house shall then notify the registrar within three days of receipt of the resignation. To my mind, therefore, and reading at the provisions of section 14.3 of 
of the Political Parties Act, while Section 33 of the Elections Act and Article 85 of the Constitution together, Section 14 deal with the resignation of a member of a political party from his party. Section 33 of Elections Act and Article 85 of the Constitution deals with eligibility of any person as an independent <coughs> candidate in an election. The question that then arises is when does time start running for purposes of both Article 85 and Section 33 aforesaid? To that question, I recall that Section 14.2 of the Political Parties Act provide that a signation from political party takes effect upon a written notice being served on the political party. But what is the meaning of taking effect? The Black's Law Dictionary 8th edition defines take effect as follows, to become operative or executed, to be enforced, to go into operation. Applying that definition in the context of this petition, it means that the decision to resign from a political party comes into force and becomes operational the minute the political party receives the written notice of resignation. I've also referred to the decision of Mativo J in Carolio Mondi as a registrar of political parties on the same issue. From the foregoing decision, the party applicant resignation from CCU was effective from 5th of April 2017. As to whether she lawfully joined WIPA was not an issue that was addressed by the committee. In any case, that issue had been dealt with by the PPDT, which found that as of 30th April 2017, the expert applicant was bona fide member of WIPA. Similarly, as to whether she could, by virtue of being such a member, be validly nominated by WIPA was not dealt with by the committee and no decisions made by that committee. Since these are not some of the grounds upon which the present application is based, I am barred from dealing with the same as new issues, pass one to order 53, rule 41 of the civil procedure rules. It was contended that the expert applicant did not place before this court all the material that was placed before the commission, and that had the same been placed before this court, it would have revealed that there were more issues than the ones which the applicant purported to have have been before the, the committee. Whereas I cannot fault the respondent for responding to these proceedings as the blame was placed on his doorstep, I have however referred to the positions of Order 53 and 71 of the Civil Procedure Rules. Therefore, the only mandatory requirement is that the applicant lodges the order, warrant, commitment, con conviction, inquisition, or record sought to be quashed. In this case, the applicant seeks to quash the decision the respondent made on the 8th of June 2017, which decision has been lodged. In this case, the proceedings which the respondents allege are missing are its own proceedings. With the due respect, there is some level of dishonesty in the position taken by the Commission. If, if it genuinely and honestly felt that apart from the decisions sought to be quashed, there were other material which would have assisted the court in arriving at a just decision. Nothing would have barred it from lodging the same. It is not worthy that the Commission instead decided to lodge, and I dare say, so inappropriately, an electronic document allegedly containing the list of members of the Party, which was not even part of the record of the proceedings before it, while omitting what was in its view crucial material which was placed before it. As a judicial tribunal, the respondent tribunal or committee is expected pursuant to the national values and principles of governance in Article 10 of the Constitution to be transparent and accountable in its dealings with candidates and the court. It is therefore improper for it to keep its own record from a court and contend that there was some material that was placed before it that is omitted from the record before the court. In my view as a judicial organ, the respondent's tribunal owes a much higher duty of disclosure than the expert applicant when it comes to administration of justice, taking into account its role not only in electoral disputes, but in the electoral system as a whole. The third interested party contended that the likely consequences if the court were to agree with the applicant would be to, to reopen the race for all those that were validly rejected on similar grounds, would probably run into hundreds and eventually affect the entire election's timelines and calendar. 
I have a wish to associate myself with the, with the case of Jacqueline Resley versus City Council of Nairobi, where it was held and I quote. The purpose of the court is to ensure that the decision making process is done fairly and justly to all parties. That the law must be followed is not a choice and the court must ensure that it is so followed. And the respondent's statements that the court's role is only supervisory will not be accepted and neither will the view that the court will usurp the functions of the evaluation court in determining the matter. The court is one of inherent and unlimited jurisdiction and it is its duty to ensure that the law is followed. If a local authority does not fulfill the requirements of the law, the court will see that it does fulfill them, and it will not listen readily to suggestions of chaos, and even if the chaos should result, still the law must be obeyed. It is imperative that the procedure laid down in relevant statutes should be properly observed. Provisions of statutes in this respect are supposed to provide safeguards for Her Majesty's subjects. Public bodies and ministers must be compelled to observe the law, and it is essential that the bureaucracy, bureaucracy should be kept in place." Unquote. In my view, what the court was saying is that the public interest plays no part in... In my view, the court was, what the court was saying is not that public interest plays no part in enforcing the law, but the courts will not shirk from their constitutional mandate of ensuring that the law is followed. It is now tried that contravention of the constitution of the statute cannot be justified on a plea of public interest, as public interest is best served by enforcing the constitution and statute, as was held in the public first county government of Mombasa Experte Outdoor Advertising Association of Kenya. I also I've also relied the case of Masalu and others versus the Attorney General that the constitution has to be given generous rather than a legalistic interpretation aimed at fulfilling the purpose of the guarantee and securing individuals full benefit of the instrument. A judge has to pass between the government and the man whom the government is prosecuting, between the most powerful individual in the community and the poorest and the most unpopular. It is of the last importance that in the exercise of these duties he should observe utmost fairness. The judicial department comes home in its effect to every man's side. It passes on his property, his reputation, his life, his all. It is to the last degree important that he should be rendered, he should be rendered perfectly and completely independent with nothing to influence or control him but God and his conscience. The greatest scourge and angry heaven ever inflicted upon an ungrateful and ascending people was an ignorant, a corrupt, and a dependent judiciary." Unquote. To the foregoing, I would add a timid and spineless judiciary. In Liverside versus Anderson, Lord Atkin held that in this country, amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace has always been one of the pillars of freedom, one of the principles of liberty for which on recent authority we are now fighting that judges are no respecters of persons and stand between the subject and any attempted encroachment on its liberty by the executive allowed to see that any coercive action is justified in law." Unquote. The purpose of judicial review is to check that public bodies do not exceed their jurisdiction and carry out their duties in a manner that is de detrimental to the public at large. It is a conscious supervision of public authorities involving a challenge to the legal validity of the decision in question. In this case, However, the issue of floodgates being opened by this decision does not arise since the only ground upon which the third interested parties complaint was allowed, being the existence of the order in miscellaneous application 67 of 2017, cannot be said to be common in those other proceedings alluded to by the third interested party. In this case, the court has found that the other issues raised before this court are the basis for justification of the committee's decision were not grounds upon which the committee made its decision. The ground upon which it did so was as a result of consideration of an irrelevant factor 
hence the decision was irrational and as usually put Wednesbury unreasonable. It may well be that the committee based its decision on issues. It may well be that had the committee based its decision on the issues now raised before me, a different outcome might have been reached. But that is not the matter before me and I cannot speculate on the same. I therefore do not see how the outcome of this application will affect any other matter as alleged by the third interested party, which matters this court is not a privy to. This, however, my view, I find that the only basis upon which the, uh, the IEBC Dispute Resolution Committee arrived at the decision of the 8th of June 2017 cannot stand legal scrutiny. It was, with due respect, hopelessly unreasonable. In the premises, this motion succeeds, and consequently, I issue the following order. I issue an order of certiorari removing this court for purpose of being quashed. The decision of the Response Tribunal made on 8th June 2017 in Complaint 79 of 2017, that decision is hereby quashed. I give an order of prohibition prohibiting the respondent from implementing the same decision. I also issue an order of mandamus compelling the respondent to include the name of the party applicant as the Wiper Movement Political Party nominee for Majakus County gubernatorial elections, which are scheduled for 8th of August 2017. I have agonized whether in the circumstances of this case I ought to award costs as submitted by Mr. Nzamba Kitonga, the respondent herein still has the mandate of presiding over the elections in which the expert applicant intends to be a candidate. On the other hand, the third interested party herein has maintained that he is a member of the vehicle the expert applicant has boarded towards her political destination. In the spirit of promoting reconciliation, it is my view and I direct that each party will bear own course of these proceedings those shall be the orders of this court. Recorded Mr. Nyamodi's uh, presence earlier on. The, the judgment is ready. So I've directed that uh, certified copies of procedures and judgment will be availed to parties at their own cost. The other matters which are actually listed for today, I think we should start at um, quarter two in the quarter 37. <laughs> 